The Lord be with you, and thank you for joining me for another video where we discuss, reflect, and pray about the unfolding apostasy that has been unleashed on the Church of England. This week's been a very interesting one in the wake of what happened at General Synod, where the Church of England Evangelical Council has released a very slickly produced video pro uh, outlining their ideas of the next steps for the Orthodox and traditional Anglicans that are still in the C of E. I agree with a lot of what they say in their video. They open by saying that the, the Church of England is something to be loved, and it is. I too love the C of E. I love its historicity, its formularies, the Book of Common Prayer, its gorgeous liturgies, and its rich breadth of churchmanship. But I'm afraid that the C of E that we love is gone. I think we could easily be caught up in nostalgia of trying to belong to something that no longer exists. The General Synod was, I think, the seminal moment of battle where two Gospels clashed, the, what I've come to call, Rainbow Gospel and the True Gospel of Jesus Christ, and they met head to head. And unfortunately, those who upheld the True Gospel, many of them went for the route of planning for compromise and playing politics instead of boldly contending for the faith. Now, don't hear me say no one did that. There were some very, very brave men and women who stood to speak openly and truthfully about the, the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ and the authority and inerrancy of scripture and the importance of ancient church tradition. But for the most part, it seems the orthodox leaders were silent or ready to give in the throw in the towel. And the CEEC seems to have suggested that. What they seem to be moving towards is something that you might call visible differentiation, which is uh, saying within the C of E, but not within it, so to speak, a church within a church, if you will. And the idea is that they want to seek a course of action where they have a sort of separate episcopacy, different bishops and their own almost province within the C of E. So it's to say the Orthodox traditionalists can do our own thing and the revisionists can go and do their own thing and never the, the, the two shall meet. Well, it's going to be very messy. I mean, what will happen on a deanery level? Will we still uh, be under the authority of diocesans? Um, so on and so forth. It's also probably got a lot of wishful thinking involved in it, because if you look at anybody who, say, holds to um, a complementarian view of ministry and doesn't think women should be ordained to the priesthood or to the episcopacy, they pretty much can't get jobs out in ordinary run-of-the-mill diocesan parishes. They have to work under a flying bishop in a parish that has passed a resolution, and they almost never reach positions of authority and power in the C of E. In fact, actually, almost no Orthodox people reach positions of authority and influence in the C of E anymore. They're very often uh, given to liberals, and that has been a sort of entryist kind of model of infiltration that's occurred in the last 30 to 40 years, of getting more and more revisionists into positions of power, then they stack the deck and get more of their revisionist friends in so that eventually they hold all the cards and the orthodox don't really have an, a way to get in to, to influence a church for the good of God, uh, for the good of the, the good of the gospel and the glory of God. And that's sort of why I think we lost the fight at General Synod. I think many evangelicals and traditional Anglo-Catholics didn't realize just how much of a minority position we now hold, how actually the majority of people in the C of E are either apostate or unwilling to challenge the apostates. They're sort of sitting on the fence, being quiet, and for various reasons, maybe political reasons or uh, out of fear or whatever it is. So the CEEC is now saying that that's what they want to pursue. It assumes that they'll be permitted to do that by those who hold authority, and I personally don't think they will. I don't think that the revisionists want the Orthodox to exist in the C of E. And if history teaches us anything from other provinces around the Anglican Communion that have stumbled into or fallen into or been pushed into abandoning God's word, then we see that they don't just want the Orthodox to sit off in their own camp and do their own thing. They want to oust them from their organization because they desire a total takeover. And I think the hints of that are already being seen on social media with many revisionists now, uh, as I've talked about earlier in another video, calling for lists to be made of Orthodox clergy who preach what they deem as 
harmful, whatever that means. And now there's even people going around, uh, revisionists, reporting Orthodox clergy uh, to their bishops and requesting CDMs against them because they oppose the new gay blessings and hold to biblical standards. So you can only imagine that that's very likely to snowball. It's going to get worse and worse. So that's a challenge to the CEEC's desire to have this sort of separate grouping. And the metaphor that came to my mind, the more I prayed about this, the more I thought about this, was that of being chained to a corpse. This was a capital punishment that was used back in the pagan times in the Roman Empire. It was a vulgar thing to do, vile and very macabre. But effectively, uh, a living person would be chained either at the shackled, either at the ankle or the, he or the, um, the wrist, to a dead body. And uh, as you can imagine, wouldn't be too bad at first if the deceased was uh, relatively fresh. But as time went by and putrefaction and decay set in, it became really horrible. They're dragging around literally a dead weight. People don't want to associate with these folks. They want to run a mile. It's disgusting. And they can't really get on with ordinary life. And in the end, actually, it usually killed the living person because bacteria and germs or viruses or whatever came over from the corpse that they were in close proximity to and they died. So I think that's actually the, the course that will happen if this visible differentiation goes ahead because they'll be lugging around the dead weight of the C of E. They'll still be yoked to, to borrow a biblical term, uh, the apostate C of E. This evangelical or orthodox grouping will be shackled to them. There will be ties and requirements that bind them. Uh, and then, of course, if things get worse and worse and worse in the C of E, then that's also going to have a ne very negative impact on those churches that have remained and want to be separate, um, you know, want to be uh, visibly differentiated. And I think less and less people will want to go have anything to do with those churches uh, because they are associated with a compromised church, less and less true Christians anyway. So those are the big challenges to that position, that idea, and it's not something that I agree with. I think we should have come out swinging, we should have fought tooth and nail, but unfortunately that didn't really happen. Not to say there aren't really good churches in the CEEC or in other evangelical organizations, but uh, me personally, all the support and um, donations and stuff that I've given them in the past, then they're not going to see a penny from me again because it seems like they've given up the fight. They just want to sort of go off and sit in the corner. And I, I, I don't abide with that. I don't think it's biblical or, or a, a New Testament ideal. If somebody falls into error and sin and false teaching, we're meant to warn them, rebuke them, call them to repent. And then if they don't, we're meant to literally cut them off a bit like a, a, a gangrenous limb or um, cut the shackle that ties us to the corpse. And if we can't do that, I guess the next best thing is to separate ourselves. And that's where a lot of Orthodox Anglicans are sitting. They're feeling like they've got a, a, a really horrible decision to make. Do we stay even if our parish is Orthodox or our, our organization that we are members of is Orthodox? Do we stay that we're connected to an unorthodox, unbiblical group um, with senior leaders who are increasingly open about their lack of biblical faith, or do we depart? And if you depart, where on earth do you go? And that's a big challenge for Anglicans. I mean, Anglo-Catholic friends of mine who are super disappointed with the society, that's a whole other video, but they have failed completely in opposing this. Um, they're wondering, do we go to the ordinariate? Which is a challenge even for Anglo-Catholics, because let's be blunt, the ordinariate is not an Anglican church. It's the Roman Catholic Church with a slightly Anglican liturgy. Um, and all of the precious doctrines of the 39 articles and the formularies that even many Anglo-Catholics value uh, is, are gone in the ordinary. You have to adopt Roman Catholic theology. And as much as I do love Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, they, I contend still, as a former Roman Catholic, that they are in deep error and those errors have never been repented. They were um, cemented, in fact, at Trent uh, uh, in the Counter-Reformation, and they've never dialed those back. So you still have to deal with things like works-based salvation and veneration and praying to the saints or even Marian worship. So 
big issues for Anglicans. The next big challenge and the question is, well, if you can't go there, where will people go? Evangelicals might have an easier time going to an um, FIEC congregation, uh, which, of course, is a very orthodox uh, group of churches and they'll hear the gospel and there'll be good Christian fellowship. But again, it's not Anglican. That's, that's the big challenge, I think, for a lot of people who are Bible believing in the C of E. They love being Anglican, and it's, it's, it's the beautiful branch of Christianity. Uh, the third option is that people depart to an independent Anglican church uh, under GAFCON because they are Episcopal and have apostolic succession and are Orthodox. They're not some weird sect. Uh, the challenge is that these are very, very small churches at the moment. There's very few of them. In, this, in, in England, because the C of E is the established Anglican church. It's been dominant for 1,500 years. There are two GAFCON options, the ANIE, which is the Anglican Network in Europe, which has uh, sub-convocations uh, of AMIE and ACE. Both of those are more low-church, evangelical-flavoured worship in terms of liturgy, and um, they're thoroughly orthodox. They're quite new. They're an idea coming out of GAFCON to try and uh, help refugees from the uh, C of E as, as things get worse. And they're under Bishop Andy Lines. Um, so there is a possibility for people to go there if they live near one. Uh, the other option, of course, is the more uh, historically established Free Church of England, which is a part of the wider uh, Reformed Episcopal family, which is connected into GAFCON, of course, in, uh, through the route of the Anglican Church in North America. And actually, there are some of their churches all around the place, and they're a good option for Anglicans. They're prayer book based and very mindful of their Anglican identity and their responsibility. And both of those groups are really orthodox. They're really strong on the Bible, strong on the formularies, and faithfully and legitimately Anglican. But the problem many, many, many Anglicans are going to have is that these are still quite small groups. There, there are not a plethora of churches around. It's going to take quite a bit of travel for most people who are Orthodox and looking to leave the C of E who want to stay Anglican. And many simply will not have one of those congregations near them. And so that's going to be a big challenge. Whatever you're discerning and praying about, my dear ones, I want you to know that uh, for what it's worth, I am praying for you. And if you're wrestling with any of this, if you're hurting and grieving and confused about the future as an Anglican who's a Bible believer in the C of E, then um, my prayers are with you. And if you need somebody to talk to or to pastor you a little, um, I'm speaking to you from my pastor's heart now. Message me, please. Email me. Um, get in contact with me and I'll do my best to to pray with you and support you. I'm very happy to have um, Zoom calls with people and to pray and to get to know people who are faithfully Anglican and who need a little support. There's no agenda to that. It's just I want to be there for people. And I know how lonely it can be uh, being an Orthodox Anglican in the C of E. I'd like to conclude with the Bible, which is always a good thing to do. Our faith is based on the inerrant word of God. And I'm speaking, reading here from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. It's chapter 1 and verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you other than what you received from me, let them be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that which that gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let that be an encouragement to you to stand firm on the word of God and to stick to the true gospel. Uh, we're not here to please men. We are here to please God. And his opinion is all that matters. So soldier on, remain firm in the faith of Jesus Christ and the word of God. And as the weeks and months unfold in this ongoing saga of apostasy, uh, you will trust, I trust that you will be led by the Holy Spirit, by the word of God to know what decisions to make and when. 
may God bless you and may he watch over you and may he protect you in these strange and trying times. Amen.